I'm Duchess Eva von Danzig, and I am here today joined by Duchess Altani and the lovely Duchess Yolande of Lockhart. Uh, and this is, of course, the crown between two roses. Thank you so much for joining us, Your Grace. Lovely to be here. Great. <laughs> so, good nobles, we come together in a spirit of fellowship, deepening of our skills, sharing our knowledge, and a shared interest in the search to find truth through Eric's experimental archaeology and historical inquiry. It is in this context that I, Altani Becky, on behalf of my kingdom, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land upon which we gather. We recognize their continuing connection to the land and culture, and we pay our respects to the elders, past, present, and emerging, and the elders from other communities who may be here today. Thank you for joining us. Again, welcome, Your Grace. So we always start off these interviews by getting to know a little bit about yourself and about your path in the SCA. So what drew you to the society and how did you get started? Um, well, that's an embarrassing question because nothing drew me to the society. Um, I actively ran away from it for a very long time. <laughs> I had a really dear friend at university called Angela, who was a brilliant musician, a totally gorgeous human being. And for about four years um, through a very slow attempt at a PhD. She was, oh, you, you should come to the SCA. You'd love it. Like you like early music and you like Scottish dancing and you like history. You'd love the SCA. And she told me a bit about it and I was, it sounds awful. Like, thanks. <laughs> Um, my really dear friend Coco, who I lived with in this crazy sort of student commune, and she was a massive SCA person, and she was, oh my god, D, you've got to come to the SCA, you'd love it! And I was, yeah, mate, I've met some of the people who've come over here for it, and like, some of them are great, and some of them are a bit awful, and she's, oh. So she tricked me and she had a 25th birthday party as an SCA event. And of course I had to go. And we stayed up all the night before making a frock. Um, and she actually taught me that I knew how to make clothes by telling me that clothes were just um, taking a two dimensional shape and rendering it as a three dimensional object. And I was, oh, is it maths? I love maths, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, we, we did an all nighter and drank in copious quantities of coffee and, and, and sang and, and, and partied and did ridiculous things as one does when you're young. And uh, we slept about two hours the next morning Then we prepped and cooked for her party. And then that night I went to my first SCA event and it was great. You know, Torg and Lindori with the Baron and Baroness of Roany, they were delightful. Um, there was, oh, I think it was, I can't remember if it was Gregory of Locks one of Brucey and I think it was Brucey um, who, when we were dancing, threw me so hard that I think I flew about eight feet and did two turns as, as I went. And happily, I was dancing. That was the first time that it happened. So I was like, I can land this. And it was just giggling and fun. I was, all right, fine, fine. You know, after years and years of people telling me I would like this, I actually did like this. <laughs> and then I turned up at festival and Angela was there and just, oh, you. I said, yeah, you were right. I was wrong. I'm sorry. <laughs> so you mentioned Torg and Londora. So I guess you began in Rowany then. I certainly did. Uh, shortly before your lovely partner began in Rowany. <laughs> and he, he was one of the first people I knew in the society as well. And he was a baby. Mm -hmm. And because I was a PhD student, I was 10 years older than everybody else. And um, basically threatened to beat up all of the old men who'd come and try and pick up the young girls and, um, you know, remembered, reminded all the young blokes that they should wash more regularly and clean themselves. <laughs> and that way they that themselves work? would pick up the young girls. <laughs> so, <laughs> yours was, your, your one was very clean. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so that, that was fun. I probably would have hung around for about two or three years and then gone off and done something else. Except that um, in very short succession, I went to my first Rowany festival. Um, I went to some local event in Politicopolis just after Rowany festival. 
and ordered some armor because I was I was going to fight and I was going to just kill lots of people and take out my violence not just as a Sydney cyclist but you know, <laughs> on the field where it's noble and then because I was a Sydney cyclist almost immediately after that I got smashed off my bicycle by a taxi and nearly died and then I went to May Coronet or Investiture I think it might have been Investiture and um Marion and de Gaunt were standing up and I was so mangled. And I'd met Kerry during the mouse. She'd been one of the people who came over to visit Coco and she was one of the lovely ones. Um, she'd come to my house for a dessert dinner. That was the first day that we met. And we chatted for a long time after that. And I, I you know, she's, you've met her, she's lovely, very kind, very generous woman. And she had heard that I'd had this horrible accident. She popped over four, five or six times during the period I was mangled, um, just to make sure I had food in the house, clean bedding, clean clothes, um, you know, drove me up to the shops a couple of times, made sure I, I had everything that I needed. So lovely. And she was determined that I should go to this event because I'd been really looking forward to it. You know, it was high, high quality, high court. I'd even been sewing some nice stuff. And of course I had a huge cast on my arm, which I'd smashed and my face was mangled. And um, she was, well, you can't wear that. So we'll put you in some of uh, my bob gear, which is just this cute little Elizabethan boys outfit. And you know, I'm 28 years old. I've been cycling for the last probably 20 years constantly. So I was very fit. And from behind, in a cute little boy's outfit with cute little puffy pants, I looked great. And she spent the entire evening bursting into laughter. And I was, okay, you have to tell me what's going on because I don't understand. And she was, well, what's happening is all these chaps are walking up behind you and going, oh yeah. And then they're getting to sort of here where they can see your face and they go, and <laughs> That was, that was hilarious. So I got halfway through the night and I was just flaking. And Meryn, um, who was princess, she's an absolute love and she was a nurse and she spotted me and gone, oh, that woman has been horribly injured. And you know, didn't want to intrude on my space. She's obviously been princess, she's got a lot on, but she could see that I was flaking and, and she sent someone over to fetch me and she's, do you just need a nap? And I was, I really do. And just nap under the high table, you know, it's it's fully curtained off. It's it's lot lots of space. We've got heaps of cushions under there for court later. You know, just have a little nap. And so I just had a little lie down. It was really nice. And then she and I think it was Elfin. Yeah, I think it was Elfin. We're just passing me snacks now and then, which was hilarious in and of itself because all of a sudden his face would pop down and they'd have a little chat going, you want some bit of this? And go, oh, that sounds lovely. Thank you. Um, you know, <laughs> Mouse drove me home at the end of the night despite being pained and, and tired. It was a great night. I had a really good time. And uh, about two months after that, once I was almost entirely healed, I went to the next principality event and I saw Marion and I was, oh, Marion, I'm so pleased to see you. You are so delightful. It was so lovely meeting you at May. And she was, oh, you sound so familiar, but I can't put your face into it. Oh, does this help? And she's, oh my God, it's you. <laughs> And then two weeks after that, I went to Tokal and met Aidwood, so <laughs> who I'm still with 26 years later for my many sins. And after all of that, I just couldn't leave. Like, these people have been so nice. And, you know, I had had a traumatic brain injury, so <laughs> changes you, changes you. <laughs> so had you been sewing before you joined the SCA or was costuming something that you started literally from that first moment? Look, I'd made a few very tatty goth skirts and I'd taken in some Victorian clothes to fit a 20th century body. And when I was at school, the girls were the academic girls or the home ec girls. And I was an academic girl. The academic girls didn't do very much home ec. You know, they might do little if one had to. One had to know how to make scones, for example, but you know. And quite frankly, I was a rat bag as a young person too. So every time someone would say, oh, you should learn some useful skills, I'd be, I will get to that in time. <laughs> and I joined the SCA and it, it was time. <laughs> you quite flourished, in fact, with your sewing and your skills in that area because you are a mistress of the laurel. And any particular favourites 
as a laurel that you'd like in your sewing skills or your creative skills? I like learning new stuff. So, you know, I've, I've recently been um, going back to lace making, which I dabbled in briefly a while ago. Um, I've been doing a lot of uh, herbal dyeing lately and, and trying to get my head around the chemistry of what was used in period um because I'm a giant nerd as we know do um, you grow your your plants for that I would or? love to but I've got very little garden space so very few of them I, I, I buy most of it in right. supplement but yeah I know you're way. a great gardener from what I remember yes so. but unfortunately you need quite a lot of quantity and okay. my garden here I've got some food I've got some natives I've got a lot of bee plants my, my garden is for the bees um, and that didn't leave a huge space for dye plants because you usually need a lot of one type. But I'll get to um, I do like working out. I like working out how clothes go. Um, so whether that's looking at extant examples, uh, reading people's papers on, on things that they've been able to look at. And I like I like working out how clothes that you can't find go. Um, so, um, when I started getting into the market women's clothing, uh, that I'm wearing today, there was a lot of high class clothing from around about this period that you still have bits left of, but there was only the, um, representation of this sort of clothing. And it was working out, how is that similar to other things that we know about? How is it different? Um, Beckler and, um, Ertzen, who, uh, most of the paintings of this sort of things, they're a little bit different to Pierre Bruegel. Um, but then some things matched. And so it was really exciting understanding, as, as Coco said, how, how two dimensions turn into three dimensions. And um, sitting there going, well, what types of pleating were people using at that time? How much fabric does that take up? And how much did fabric cost? So how much am I likely to be able to afford? And, and solving those wacko problems. I mean, the next wacko thing I want to do is um, I've got some rough sundaway, uh, hence for lace making. And I want to get a gang of us together and work out which starches are stiffest and, and smell the least and yellow the least and what else. Because uh, we know that there are different types of starches that were used and it's, it's, it's fun experimenting to see which ones do a great job and which ones you might have used because you're in a human environment and they get less manky when it's humid or um, they, they turn less yellow and this is a period when people really like white roughs rather than yellow roughs or blue roughs or pink roughs. And I also want to do starches of the yellow, pink and blue because nobody does that in the SCA and we ought to because it's really fun. So there are actually starches <laughs> oh, yeah. or, or, or the lace that the roughs that are slightly pink or blue. Yeah, I can yeah. imagine yellow and white, of course, but not the other colours. Yeah, there, there are different um, fashions of colours and... Um, I am going off something that I read 15 years ago here. So this may have been superseded in knowledge, but as far as I know, um, they, they would talk about starch being used to change the color of some rather than having to buy a whole new rough because you can dip it into your starch if it's colored, it will hold that color until you wash it again. And then if it, that color becomes unfashionable, you just launder it really well, dip it in a different color. You save the money of having to buy a new rough. Okay. That's amazing. Yeah. So you you always look so fabulous, and I know that you're quite a prolific maker as well as as an academic. Um, what would you say your specialty is? Unpicking. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a useful skill to have. <laughs> yeah. I I wouldn't describe myself as absolutely brilliant at anything except for undoing the things I cock up. Um, and, and redoing them to be less cocked up. Um, and, and I don't know, I describe myself as an academic. I, I, it's a real shame I wasn't born a century earlier. A friend of mine once described me as, um, you know, you, you just got a little bit too late to be at your peak uh, because that um, 1920s enthusiastic amateur is sort of where I, I peg myself for a lot of these things. I'll read a lot of stuff, I'll go to conferences, but I would struggle to make a career out of it because I lack the focus of my friends who do do it as a career. Now, I, I see their ability to synthesize ideas across a broad swathe of knowledge and, and do that focus of, of, of writing. And even before I had a taxi to the head, I was wading my way through my own PhD, which I never did finish. I, I blame the taxi to the head, but I probably should have done it anyway. I, I just have some money. 
<laughs> um, but, you know, it was a, a topic I was really interested in. It was on comedy. And I, even then I was just, oh, God, I can't read any more Bakhtin. <laughs> so, <laughs> enthusiastic amateur. But the things I like doing, aside from unpicking, um, I really like knitting. I find knitting really enjoyable and I really like period knitting. I'm trying to get my head around more um, period types of cast-ons, um, shaping and that sort of stuff. Um, and that's what's taken me down into dyeing lately, which is also really yeah. enjoyable. Dyeing is quite fun because it's, it's like being a witch in Macbeth and um, it makes a mess in the kitchen. And there's chemistry to it, which is also quite interesting. So it, you know, I'm too old to play in mud puddles technically. So this is as close as you can get. <laughs> Never too old to play in mud puddles, I'm sure, Yolanda. 100% true. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you've been in the society for quite a few years now. You were princess first yeah. and then queen? Yeah. How so many times were you princess for? Once princess, twice queen. And what did you find the difference in between those two roles? Uh, well, any difference is my fault because Edwin and I ran the um, lockout to Kingdom Pole. Um, and we did that for good reason. <laughs> um, I, I, I remember the principality of Lockhart as being a lovely small um in some ways it was a more personal group um and i think that's just that you know there were very technically fewer people it was one country um there would have been i don't know maybe there were a thousand of us i know that we had 650 members because we needed that to go to, to kingdom but all up we might have had say 1200 1500 people and it wasn't impossible to know most of them if you traveled to maybe four events a year um because people would travel far and wide so if you went to Rowany Festival something in Brisbane something in South Australia or um Western Victoria and then down to either Inner Garden or Anyala because they tended to go to each other's beds <laughs> but yeah. not elsewhere you could meet most people and and that was lovely um but structurally it was really problematic having the West Kingdom um it's a cat. Yeah. Um, yes. It's She's a proper a... Zoom meeting now. There's a cat in it. I have one cat in her inbox and the other cat's going, I want to be in there as well. Nice. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> please continue. Sorry about that. But having the West Kingdom in charge of Lockhart was really problematic because the legislative structure of the West as a mundane place is so dramatically different to a Commonwealth country. And so there would be problems that they couldn't see why it was a problem. Um, it was a difficult time difference. Um, it was, it was, oh, I want to say nine hours, but it's a big difference. Yeah, it depends where uh, you are. Yeah. Um, it was, there were some people who got the culture of Lockhart and there's some people who weren't. So around about the time I joined, uh, the whole archery saga was going on. And I just remember seeing people whose enormous body of knowledge and work and skill um, was considered very unimportant because it wasn't what we did. And so well, it's what we do, you know, we're part of you. So by extension, it is what you do, but because there wasn't the, the lobbying group at that meeting, um, you know, with that crown in those peers, it was much harder to get those messages through. And so as prince and princess, facing those difficulties was something that just seemed pointless. <laughs> why, why are we doing this to ourselves? Um, there was a great purpose for this when Lockhart became part of the SCA, you know, going under the West who were a very welcoming kingdom. They were very encouraging. They, they, physically and, and, and spiritually and, and, and financially even with um, coming over so often and with helping out with, with all sorts of, of different things and, and giving enormously of their time. They were fantastic. But that time had sort of gone. And we were like the 24-year-old living at home. And, and, and mum and dad were just sort of, you're a great kid. 
love your hips just looking forward to you moving out <laughs> and you know the I think there was like four years between me joining the society and Edward and I reigning for that principality reign and that that was really to go back to that very poor analogy it was a time when that 24 year old got a well-paying job and they could afford to pay rent and they had their own car and everyone was just sitting there going <laughs> <laughs> and I don't even know if that answered the question <laughs> That's okay. and then you became queen yes and you've well, been queen twice yeah that was Abbott's fault really <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So I think uh, what, the principality was. Oh, go on. No, 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 go. I was going to say, uh, what was one of your most treasured memories from any of your reigns? God. There are a lot, but I've got a really terrible memory. Um, I did write some down, but that involves wearing glasses and I haven't put them on. Um, oh, um, some of the peerages that we've done have been really exciting and some of the people that we've met as babies growing up and becoming amazing leaders. So I, I actually wanted to touch on both of those. I did write those down. <laughs> so some of my favourite things have been getting to make peers and we've made a lot of amazing peers in those reigns. Um, one of my favourite was Guthrin because prior to her, we didn't have an early period costuming laurel and She'd, she'd come along, um, yeah, she joined the society years before I did. And, and when I met her, she was making these really cute um, uh, German 16th century things and the occasional sort of Elizabethan -y thing. And she was a But um, probably about four or five years, oh, my internet connection is unstable. If I disappear, I've got a phone to switch over to just because it's very windy up here and anything could happen. Um, and I should have turned it to mute. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so about four or five years um, after I met her, she went from this lovely late period stuff into really, no, it would have been, more, would have been less than four, three or four years, uh, into doing a whole lot of Norse research. And at first she was doing the this is my Norse outfit and it was VSCA Norse. And then she was, you know what? I'm really interested in working out why they do this. Where does this come from? How does this get put together? And, and she got into all of this. I'm going to, I'm going to look at this find. I'm going to look at these textiles. And I remember she put out this paper and I think I read an early copy of it. Um, her Laurel Porsche. She knew I liked this sort of stuff and she sent me a copy of it. And it was talking about a construction of a smock based on the way that the little scraps of linen were pleated under the jewellery that was left. And it disagreed with some of the academic reconstructions of it. But reading through this paper, I was just sitting there going, no, you're right. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's how it was. That's, because everything that she was talking about made sense of both the artefact and how you would wear the item. And because she'd had those years of wearing clothes and working in clothes and, and understanding how the clothes and the body moved together, she just had so much more insight than people who were working in museums who, who didn't get to make those leaps. And it was so exciting to be able to have that first early period clothing laurel in, in Lockhart be someone that we'd chosen. Because up until then, on, on the council, it was hard to have discussions about early period. And the minute she came on, it was easier because her knowledge base was so good. She'd be able to say, well, what you're missing is. <laughs> and it, it was fantastic because I really love that style of clothing. And I was so excited to see just the burgeoning of it, the, the blossoming of it as, as a pursuit. Um, and like some of our other ones are really excited too, being able to give Rothgar his pelican because we met him as a baby. And it was very exciting to give him a pelican. That was lovely. Um, but seeing the babies grow up was the other really lovely thing. Um, I remember meeting a lot of House Odenata uh, very early on um, in their SCA careers. 
And I think my last reign as queen um, was probably the first time that Daniel went to festival and he was a tiny, tiny person the first time I met him. And uh, he was at children's battles, screaming and waving a boffer sword and very cute and very blonde and very, very small. And the last time I saw him at festival, he was a St. John's volunteer. And, and I was just, oh, my God. And he was, oh, well, I thought, you know, I'm going to go to a lot of festivals in my life, but these guys need some help. And I've joined St. John's because I was aware of how great they were from festival. And I thought I'd just give up this one to do it as a thing because you should. Was, oh. Lovely. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's this occasional Duke and Duchess who you met when they were infants and um, <laughs> yeah, and some other Dukes and Duchesses you met when they were slightly less infants. Altani, yeah. So um, I'm very old, but <laughs> but everyone I know has grown up very well. <laughs> you actually just touched on something. Children's sport battle. Yeah. Mm. You are known as the queen of the children's sport battle. Great fondness for you have leading the children into battle. I think it must be one of the most favourite events that ever happens at festival for the knights and all their, all the, <laughs> sorry, Eva, how do you cope? I'm not sure it's all the knights. <laughs> I'm very disappointed that you're always on the wrong side, but whatever. <laughs> Haven't you been on the other side leading them? Nobody, I have to I have to say this for the order. Nobody understands how scary that battle is for us. Oh, I do. I do. Oh, <laughs> no, I, I physically understand it because I'm always in between the children and the night, so I get hit by both. <laughs> I have to admit, the couple of times that I've been on the children's side as queen, I've been hit by the children. They don't care <laughs> no. who you are. If you're an adult, you're getting whacked. You're going down. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I said they're going like, I have known you literally since you were one year old person. You you have good eyes on for me and you are targeting me. Now, what is this? <laughs> I, I'm the one who will give you chocolate in five minutes, but I will remember I won't remember. You will get the chocolate. <laughs> I think you're very well loved for the children's sport battle, Yolande. Oh my god, it's um, yeah, it's a weird one. Uh, every year we try to de-escalate the violence. Some years we have success. Um, we instituted a very important "don't kill them once they're dead" policy, and I think one year that worked really well. Um, it was the last year. I was really looking forward to 2020 because I was thinking 2019. It was. It was the cleanest one we've had for a while. They, they, they stopped thumping them shortly after they died. It, it was good. <laughs> there were no tears on either side. I did not get hit in the head once. <laughs> but um, yeah, we're, we're going to have to do a lot of retraining when we go back to real person. But I, I didn't invent that. That was the thing that Vandal, I think, invented. Or maybe oh. it was Devin. Um, it was some terrible people from the South who I love very dearly. And um, they thought it would be hilarious to have me lead the children because we're about the same height. And they also knew that as a Sydney cyclist, I am filled with constant rage and um, <laughs> need ways to work it, work it through, work it through, get it out into the people. And um, I think they also, some night had really annoyed them and they were sort of, well, I can't hit the night, but she can and they can um but i've always been amazed by how generous so many of the knights are um king Yadi is one of my favorites because almost every year he's one of the first ones there um oh, you know edward's at most of them although in several years he has been known to hide behind with the chocolate bag and um get swarmed um, afterwards with the chocolate bag guarding the chocolate babe i, I couldn't go in i had to guard the chocolate um <laughs> All the Kiwi nights were amazing. Um, Alpha's usually really good. He did have one night's meeting that left the children outside baying for blood. That was a mistake, mate. Never, never have a meeting through Kids at all. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> that's a timetabling issue. <laughs> yeah, well, look, you know, that, well, uh, if you had been in charge of the timetable, it would have been much better. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's a very funny event. And I think one of the really nice things about it, though, was that in the early days of it, very few knights had children. 
it was only some of the really old knights who, who had families at that stage. And so they didn't know many of the children and most of the kids didn't know many of the knights. And one really nice thing about it has been seeing the number of knights that would sit down and talk with the kids and say, oh, that was a really good blow. Or, oh, that was really clever what you did. I saw that bit of strategy, bright, bright brainy. <laughs> And the kids would just blossom under that. And then the next time they saw that night, they'd be, oh, hello, do you remember? And I'd be, oh, yes, yes, I, I do. And it broke down some barriers that didn't need to exist. And <laughs> then I think for some of the guys, it was sort of, actually, I do quite like children because now several of them have got several children. <laughs> and it was, it was just a really nice way of bringing, hello, um, sundry young people together as, as this one's coming together with this meeting um, <laughs> in ways that they ha previously hadn't. I really enjoyed. Sorry. That's lovely. <laughs> there is one of the proud <laughs> tournament champions of the Knights Battle. I've got to say, a lot of these kids have surprising skills. They're very wily with their plans. They're very nimble with their feet and they're very fine with their sword play. <laughs> There's a lot of tactics. I remember, uh, well, I think my favorite children's battle moment that I got to witness, luckily, I think I was dead somewhere just watching, but there was the most adorable, and I don't even know who this child was, but he would have only been maybe three or four tiny, tiny little thing with a painted party colored great helm and a matching surcoat and a matching shield. And uh, I think it was Sir Brennan Halfhand was dead and he had a bucket over his head. And this little child is just wailing on his corpse and hitting him. <laughs> in. And I saw at the moment that he got distracted, he's still swinging by the way, and he's looking at something else that has caught his eye. And then he slowed down, he looks <laughs> down at Brennan, boots him in the, bu in the head, <laughs> the bucket in the head and then runs away. <laughs> <laughs> just savage they can be you have to wait to the age for the age of moral responsibility when does that the toddlers will go you every time <laughs> but then the toddlers will turn around and realize they've killed somebody and be really upset yeah oh, which is well, also incredibly adorable when they've realized i think it might have been ad's one of ad's ch children it was his son and i think he he was killed yeah. And his son came up to him utterly in tears. And it was just, it's all good. It's all fine. I'm still fine. But it was just, <laughs> oh, you just feel it. Yeah. That's so nice. There, there, there is some awkwardness with the, someone has murdered my parent. And I have a lot of emotions about that, which is the one downside of chivalry, having children. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure this one who is sort of occasionally peeking around the corner would go, oh, yeah, that's, just that's fine that's normal I'll just go and kill him again i'm fairly <laughs> sure that young man has murdered his father on more than one occasion in that, uh, that battle <laughs> sure. my recollection is the grudge match right yeah. <laughs> yeah. so uh what is your favorite event that you've had the privilege of frequenting or visiting oh that's a hard one i know there's so many kind of fair look I really love Canterbury Fair. I think it's an amazing event and the people are great. Like some of my absolutely favourite people are over there. Um, the, the first one we went to as k q was just after um, they joined Lockhart from Kaid. And that was a really, really weird event because, um, you know, half the people were really psyched about it and the other half was sort of, I'm not sure how I feel about this. And we didn't know enough people to know A, who was who, and B, how to convince the, I'm not sure how I feel about this group, that they should feel great joy because, yeah. And also, you know, we're, we're not that exciting that you look at us and go, no, I feel great joy. Um, so <laughs> we, um, we had a cunning plan, which was, well, given that we don't know any of the adults, um, except for a handful who are going to be lovely to us anyway, because they're delightful. Um, what we'll do is we'll hang out with the kids and that way we'll look like really nice people who make a point of being kind to children and I'll blend in height wise so if anyone hates me they won't be able to spot me in a hurry and um, you know Edward can piggyback three or four at once because he's really good at piggybacks 
And the worst case scenario is everybody ends up hating us, but their children will like us. So in 20 years, everything will be great. <laughs> Couldn't go wrong. It was a very a flawless plan. Um, and look, you know, we went back to Canterbury Fair many times and would go again in a heartbeat. It's, it's fantastic. Um, and, and, you know, I've had some great Rowany festivals as well. Um, I, I've been up to uh, Great Northern War and it's been some brilliant ones of those. Um, I guess I've got some fantastic memories from Tokal. I met Aidwood at a Tokal. He landed on me. Um, that was unexpected. And <laughs> I just realised what you said. He landed on you. So he actually yeah. fell on you? No, he dived. Um, <laughs> Please, he was can you remember? Well. Sorry? Can you remember the story of why he dived onto you? Mouse had introduced us earlier in the evening and she'd been, I think you two would really get on. And he was helping to run the event. And I was, oh, hi, I'm Yolanda, nice to meet you. And he was, oh, yeah, hi, good to meet you. Okay, bye. And I was, well, that went really well, Mouse. Thank you. Yes, Philly, I am the hottest and my ego is just fine. It's fine. It's not bruised at all. <laughs> And um, anyway, he was still in the kitchen several hours later cleaning up and they had a lot of leftover wine because they'd had some mulled wine and the kitchen crew thought the cleaning up would be better with the wine, uh, which doubtless <laughs> it was. Um, but then he was walking around outside. It was, um, I don't know if everyone's been to Tokal, obviously not because this is going out. It's held at a building that was briefly a monastery and is now an agricultural college. And the main hall is built as a sort of 1980s version of a medieval monastery. So it has these beautiful big buttresses. And it is freaking freezing there in the middle of winter. You'll notice I have not sworn once yet, I think. It's a miracle. Um, <laughs> trying so hard. <laughs> anyway, we were all sitting together. Um, I was with Coco and a bunch of her friends. And we had cloaks behind us and over the top of us. Because if you put eight people together with four cloaks under and four cloaks on top, it sort of keeps you vaguely warm. And the wind was whipping through. And it was a little bit too north to snow. Um, but there's definitely sleet. And all of a sudden, there's this shambolic man standing in front of me, wavering slightly. And he just points at me and goes, you! And I was, hello? And he's I've been looking for you. And I said, oh. And he dived onto the group. He reached under the cloaks and he reached under my skirts and grabbed my calf. And he said, oh, feel that muscle tone, your mind tonight. And I grabbed his nose and I twisted it. And he insists I broke it. I did not break it. <laughs> and I said, I think you should move your hand. And then a few seconds later, I said, the other way. And he did. <laughs> And later that night, he apologised. He was that was extremely inappropriate. It was it was probably sexist. Um, I just I thought you know you'd been really nice when we met, and I thought you were really pretty, and 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 I wanted to come and meet you again. And and then when I saw you, I thought that was really funny. And for half a second, it sort of was, but I know it's it's all right. it, it was it it was novel. It's it, it's staying with me. <laughs> I've, I've been a young woman for a long time and no one's ever tried that move before. <laughs> but look, at, you, you stayed together. It, it worked. Well, you know, it was such a unique approach that 26 years later, he's still here. So. <laughs> I imagine you and Aidan have had some good good times as crown and as princess and prince and princess. Yeah, like good times and hard times. We, we reigned through some very difficult reigns. Um, just with sundry things that were going on outside of our control. And, and a few of them were things that we did to ourselves, like um, going from principality to kingdom. That was a lot of work um, and a lot of convincing. Um, there was a big number of people who were really happy about the idea. We probably didn't run it past a great many people before we announced it. We ran it past a call for you. We did tell the seneschal. We <laughs> 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 would always tell your seneschal. Um, we, we talked with uh, the peers that we were closest to, but we didn't make broad statements. And, um, so I think it came as a bit of a shock that we were just announcing a poll. Um, I, th I think the 
people might have been expecting, you know, a, a couple of speeches or something, and we'll do a poll in a few months, but just sort of, no, and now you're all here. <laughs> this is what we're going to do. Um, most people were happy because nobody likes to be a 24 year old in their parents' basement. That turns you into a weirdo on the internet, and the internet wasn't very good in the 90s. Um, but some people were really <laughs> upset. And I got a, a few phone calls going, dude, you have made a terrible mistake. And I was, maybe, we'll find out. And I got one really well-written letter from a peer who I really like, who's going to remain nameless, um, except it was a man, I'll go that far. And, and he gave his excellent reasons as to why it was a terrible, terrible idea and would never work. And he was very fair about it. He was, look, you know, I absolutely see your reasoning. I absolutely understand how you came to this position, but I know these people much better than you. I've been paying far longer than you and it's never going to work. And a year and a half later, he wrote us another lovely letter. It says, I've, I've had time to reconsider. I've had time to witness a lot of things that have happened since. It's a brilliant idea. It's going to be great. <laughs> and, and he was a part of making it great. He was a part of making the kingdom really fantastic. Um, so I should tell you who he is because he gets to own that bit, but I won't in case he's embarrassed about the first part. <laughs> he can let me know. I'll change his anecdote later. Um, it is lovely know. that he uh, he did follow up though, because I will say when you rain, and this might be a I don't know behind the curtain thing, but people are really forthcoming to tell you when they think you fucked up. Excuse my language, <laughs> but very rarely do they come forward and go, "Actually, I see what you did." Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and it's it's always the people who who give the best reasons for why they think you've made a terrible mistake, because people. Now that we're swearing, people are so happy to go, oh, what the fuck was that? And you sort of, it was a, it was a decision. <laughs> You're an idiot. You go, no, that's ableist and, and I'm not. And, and those people, they, they, they never apologise later. But the ones who sit there go, all right, well, I sort of understand, but, you know, here's where I'm coming from and here's, here's the background, here's the history and the data and, and here's this session and... Those are the people who always stay engaged. And I love that the society is full of them. And I also love that they change their mind when, when circumstances change, because that's the mark of a sane person. We apparently got quite a few, thank goodness. <laughs> it's also a mark of growth, I think, also for the kingdom. Yeah. As well. Yeah. Uh, some of the other things that happened during our reigns um, were issues that had been left for a while because they were difficult. And every now and then a rain comes along and, and they just have a batch of those hanging over them. Um, I, I'm not the only person on this panel. In fact, every single one of us on this panel has, has had a rain like that. And, and, and that is hard, but um, it's, it's balanced out by, I don't think you can ever do a job that makes everyone happy. And I don't think you can ever do a job that everyone looks at you and goes, no, no, that was a fair and just decision. Like there are people who hate my guts and half of them, you know, it's fair and right that they do so because I did something that they're never going to reconcile with as being a great idea. And their reasoning for, for thinking about that is perfectly valid. My reasoning for what I did is also perfectly valid. We just come at it from very opposing positions. And I don't mind that they hate me. You know, it's, it's, I don't take it personally because it's not personal and, and, and they're just sort of, that, that bitch terrible. <laughs> that lot I love. Um, there, there's some who sit there and go, oh, I hate her. And I was like, yeah, you can hate me all you like. And you're a dick. <laughs> and, and the reason they hate me is that I pointed out they were being a dick and they did not like that. <laughs> In every group, you get some people who are dicks. And unfortunately, the crown sometimes has to deal with that. Well, we don't have to deal with them being dicks. People are allowed to be dicks. Any dicks in the audience, if that's what you wanted to, and you're keeping it to yourself and you're just reveling in your dictum, I am here to support you. It is your <laughs> choice. You are allowed. But don't make others suffer for your dickery. That's where the crown will get involved. The minute you make it somebody else's problem, that's where it goes wrong. <laughs> and that's my position on dicks. <laughs> that's a solid position to have. Yeah. So... Uh, I know, I know from my experience, you and Edward have always been uh, an asset when it comes to giving good rain advice. So for folks that might be watching that would be interested in raining in future, what piece of advice would you give to them? 
I think Queen Guthrie gave the greatest piece of advice I've ever heard, which is always go to the lavatory before court. And, um, <laughs> that is very important indeed. It's, it's very important. Um, the only thing I would add to that is you can never please everyone. So don't step away from what you know to be or what you believe to be the right thing to do. Because even if you're wrong, you will be able to talk with people afterwards and say, this is what I knew about the situation at the time. This is the, the moral argument that I brought to the position. That's how I made that decision. And any reasonable person would go, that's fair. Um, even if they hate your guts, I'll still acknowledge it was fair. Um, if, if you do something because you don't want to upset somebody else, uh, because you're trying to be really conciliatory where you, you, things aren't able to be reconciled, that's when you step away from what you know to be the right thing to do, that's, that's when you make problems. So try to compromise only on things that are fine to compromise on. And sometimes you just have to say, look, I can't get involved or we can't give you an answer that will make you happy. Um, sometimes also you, you can just sit there and go, if, if you, we get engaged with this, it's not going to a place that you like, you will like. Um, it, it, it will take things in a direction that it doesn't need to go and that might be more damaging than helpful. And you know, be, being willing to just get out of a situation if you have to get into this situation, then just acknowledging that you can only do your best, but trying to do that best. That was a terrible answer. <laughs> no, no, it wasn't a terrible answer. It's actually a very interesting answer and quite important for others to hear that as well. Um, these are things that you will get into when you do rain and how do you deal with them? Because you, crowns, Every crowns rain will have asked. something. Well, a thing that we found in our reigns were crowns were often asked to situations that they didn't need to be in. And sometimes we'd say, hmm, uh, there are valid reasons why they get asked of them. I hasten to add, um, you know, sometimes if you're the baron and baroness of a group and you have a big problem within your group, a really easy way of not putting yourself on one side or the other is to step back from that problem and get the crown into it if they're from a distant group. And I think that's actually quite intelligent to do, but it can also be unhelpful because you don't know any of these people, you don't know answers. And quite often the reason that the, the Baron and Baroness are finding it problematic is because both people in the argument are right. There are a lot of arguments in the SCA where there's no right person. There are two right people who are acting with honour and, and courtesy as they understand it and, and in all sorts of good ways, but they're diametrically opposed anyway because a lot of things don't have an A or a B answer. There's a sort of half A, half B in between. And because that's not how people operate over time, just very normal, I come at this from a different direction to the way you come at it, can turn into a, a quite a fractious thing. Um, what's a good example? I, you know, people who are clean flatmates living with people who are messy flatmates. They're both great flatmates, but they drive each other nuts. And that happens on baronial and kingdom principality levels as well. And you know, it's, it's not right to be a perfectly neat person. It's not right to be a messy person. People are people, you fall somewhere along that spectrum. But when as Crown, you get engaged in those sorts of situations, you know, all you can do is just say, oh, I think everybody's right. Have an award, um, you know, pass some cake, <laughs> just sit with this and try and smooth it over that way. Or just, <laughs> I'm running away. <laughs> it's nothing to do with me. Don't drag me into your house cleaning your things. <laughs> it's funny you mention that because I, um, I have those talks a lot with uh, when it comes to interpersonal issues because I do think that like any group you join or any job you have, you're going, they're going to be, as you said, there's going to be dicks or there's going to be people that you don't agree with. Um, but I think that emotions are always higher higher and heightened in the SCA because we talk about ideals. We talk of, you know, we're, we're reenacting the ideals of the Middle Ages and one person's ideal will be different to another. And because we sort of do try to treat it like our own utopia in a lot of ways, like the perfect society outside of mundane society where we can be our heroic elevated selves that people get very disheartened when other people's 
ideals don't match theirs. And that's usually what happens is that one person disagrees with somebody else, but they're very emotional about it because we're mm -hmm. talking about honor and chivalry. And suddenly it's not just that you're disagreeing with someone, it's that the other person is the literal embodiment of the devil. And there's no way you're going to agree on anything. And I do feel for the B&Bs and having been crowned, you know, I feel for anyone who has to deal with those situations because it, it's not easy. No, I could never be a baroness. I'd, I'd have murdered at least seven people and I've got a chipper to dispose of them <laughs> in the garden. But they make great blood and bone on the upside. <laughs> so I'm sure have... you could be baroness. Um, no, really? ultimately, I absolutely could not, but I promise you I have not murdered any of your properness. <laughs> There's so many missed opportunities I'm hearing here. I'm so sad that you didn't get a big fighting career because I would have loved to see you just smash bulls. And I'm sad that you would be a very... Uh, Aggressive? What's the word? Assertive baroness, I think. You would definitely I, solve some problems. <laughs> I would solve the problems by having people leave the society and swear never to talk to that horrible woman again. And fair enough to them. I'm still thinking about getting authorised, though. I've, I've been working on my knees and um, boxing has taught me that I can just base... I, I took up boxing recently. Um, I, I, I can just shift the way that I move on my feet in ways I didn't think I could. So, um, yeah, once, once lockdown ends, baby... We, we could be having some words. <laughs> I'm so excited. I'm yes, do it. I'm sure sure it's never too late, I'm a very young 54. Very young. <laughs> <laughs> My squire is turning 53 this year, so you're yeah. fine. We can, we, can be, we can be buds. It'll be fine. <laughs> no, like, and, and you're quite right. Somebody once said to me, the problem with the dream isn't dream. It's the, um, the idea that there is one way to play. I think the first thing I ever got in trouble in the society about was there was a really lovely person who did lots of amazing stuff, but was just a bit handsy with the young girls. And he was older and, and I'm old. So he was older than old. Um, and when I was young, I was your age, um, you know, blokes were handsier than they are now because it was considered less wrong. And he was being handsy with some pretty young girls. And I was sort of, times are changing. They've changed since you were my age. I am no longer technically my age because you think I'm their age, but I'm not. Um, this, this is inappropriate. Let's, let's, let's stop. Let's not do it. And that was very poorly received. Um, very, very poorly <laughs> received. And I sort of, you know, tried to be nice about it the first time and and then by about time number four I was sort of okay we're just not doing it it's just not happening if, if you keep it up <laughs> you know what you can't do it at my house you're not allowed in my house anymore and and this is someone who did amazing stuff in lots of ways now it's not a bad person it's not someone who who was some sort of horrible sexual predator um you know he he, he, he was just he, he was a person who had learned their physicality at a time before the time we were in and had not changed with the times. But because there was a resistance to changing the behaviour around the people who expressed dis disturbance with the behaviour, I was just, okay, you're banned from the house. And, oh, it was like I had said, I'm going to murder all of your children and then I'm stealing your car. Um, mm. It was it was very... and And I... I remember sitting there going, but I was courteous. I, telling this person that there are boundaries and, and that they need to respect those boundaries, that's courtesy. And, and then saying, you know, there will be repercussions if you don't respect mm. those boundaries. To me, that was treating that person with the respect to saying, look, you have choices, you're allowed to make them, but if you choose this path, then I'm going to choose that path and, and, that's that's what will happen to me that was treating them with respect and respect was an important part of courtesy no 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 that's not how courtesy works 26 years later that is how courtesy works in the society um people changed an enormous amount it, it, it's like when i joined we were still a few years behind the mundane world and now i think in some ways a lot of us are, are a little bit ahead of a lot of mundane workplaces um because they are people looking out for the new people? There are people making sure the children are safe. Um, there have been some 
legal incidents in the US that have made them much better, but in lockout, people were already um, aware of those sorts of issues and, and pushing hard against them being able to happen. Uh, there's a lot of, um, of, of safety focus. There's a lot of um, inclusivity focus. We're not always great at it, but it's something that we try to do and, and we consciously try to do. And I really like that. I really like the fact that over, over my time of a society, and I've had very little to do with this being a happening thing, by the way, I'm exceptionally lazy. This is stuff that other people have managed. But it's, it's become a really important part of the culture that courtesy involves inclusivity and a feeling of safety for everybody, not just the people with power, not just the people who are going to be upset if their feelings get slightly uh, up, touched in one area or another. Everybody has to feel comfortable for it to be actually courteous. And I love that shift in the way that we define it. I think that's really strong and, and it gives me a lot of hope for the future. Hmm. I think it's good that you at least broach that conversation, even though obviously that one time didn't work out because there are a lot of people that if they see someone doing something that they don't necessarily agree with they just go well that person is an a-hole and I'm going to just not deal with them whereas that having that conversation probably at least enlightened him slightly and he had the opportunity to learn from it and he rejected it but there are lots of people that would go oh I didn't realize that makes you uncomfortable and then learn something from it so those conversations are so important yeah and I think the reason I felt empowered to do that in the SCA was that one of my first things was Ragnar's knighting it was like maybe the second event I ever went to Ragnar got knighted at and as part of his ceremony they said that a peer in the kingdom should speak and be silent and I was oh wow that's a really strong thing to enjoin members of your kingdom to do I didn't mm -hmm. fully get that you know peers should do that and, and you lackeys should just do cleaning <laughs> I was, oh, we should all do that. That sounds great. That's a really good society. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I've actually got a, well, what's come through on the chats, Yolande. Uh -oh. it's, it's safe. You are so full of beans. And well, Rosalind, I, in fact, from Rowany was saying that she absolutely loves your enthusiasm. I must admit, your enthusiasm tonight and whenever we've seen you, at an event, you are so enthusiastic and you're so welcoming to everyone. Um, I'm basically a golden retriever, it is true. <laughs> but, um, I do drink a lot of hot chocolate and I feel that the level of caffeine in my bloodstream at any given point is fairly high. Very high. <laughs> you're welcome to everyone. And look, I've seen that as a newcomer myself, welcoming into your home and teaching me and we at that point of time and taking us under your wing um in royal households and as a friend and seeing you just establish that friendship with people but that's because i'm incredibly lazy and i'm really good at spotting talent so if you encourage the talent then they'll come in and do all the work and they'll think warmly of you because you gave them cups of tea and hot chocolate in their early days <laughs> It's really just about a whole 20 years plan ahead. You'd be nice to the young, they'll look after you when you're old. Then. You did mention that indeed. <laughs> <laughs> but no, like most people in the society are great. Why wouldn't you want to be friends with them? They're, they're really interested in anything from whacking people to making mead to making hats to fish tanning in Finnish 11th century cultures. <laughs> Oh, I'm, I've always wanted to meet a fish tanner. One day I will. I bought a, a fish skin purse in the UK once, but the woman who tanned them wasn't there that day. And to this day, I am bereft. <laughs> yeah. All those things are great things. The people who are into those sorts of things are going to be interesting. There's going to be something about them that you'll want to have a chat with and, and learn something about. So why wouldn't you be nice to newcomers? Maybe it's, you it's will not inspire from this meet. Maybe you'll inspire from the interview to this night that somebody out there will take up fish tanning just for yes. you. Yes. I, I will come and a and, challenge and, to look up fish <laughs> tanning for Duchess Land. Please do not send me all of your fish tanned items on the post. My postman is a very nice person and they do not deserve that. Unless you're very good at the fish tanning, in which case it should probably be safe. I have to admit, I've always looked at you of the, uh, as the epitome of grace and the fact that you're, you've made laziness look graceful is amazing to me. 
<laughs> sloth laurels, here we come. <laughs> You're not a sloth. I can be. <laughs> no, look. Um, you know, when I joined VSCA, my models were people like Rowan and Gabrielle and Marguerite and Elaine. And, and they were exactly the same. They were so gracious and so welcoming and, and encouraging. Like, you know, I remember the first time I met Gabrielle, she was, oh, are you interested in frocks? I was, yeah. I just, oh, come around. We'll do some stuff. And, you know, 26 years later, she's still, come around. We'll do some stuff. Marguerite's the same. She lives up the road. Rowan would be, but she lives in Politicopolis and I'm legally not allowed to visit her at the moment because we're under lockdown. Sorry, Rowan. <laughs> it's, it was very bad because I've been really bad at visiting her for two and a half years now. We've only been under lockdowns for one and a half years. So <laughs> it's probably three and a half. She's going to hit me, but fair. <laughs> well, I think we are now coming up to our hour. So was there anything that we didn't touch on that you'd like to chat about before we call it a night? Yeah. I had a cheat sheet, but I can't read it. So <laughs> um, oh, I just want to say the very best thing in the SCA was that there's somebody to nerd with on every single topic that you can imagine. And, and I really like that. I, I like the fact that somewhere in this society, there will be someone who is just as passionate as you are about, you know, 14th century button technology and, and, and construction. I think that's amazing. Um, and, and I did put down at the bottom, um, I like the fact that we have new models of leadership that are more inclusive and not just about swinging a stick or bring it, being an extrovert. Um, that's been another really nice change for society. You know, you, you don't have to be the loudest person in any room now to have your excellence registered and recognised. And I've, I've seen that shift in the peerages. Um, and I've seen that shift with our models of crowns. You know, we've had some really quiet crowns and they've been lovely, just you know, delightful people that, you know, you watch them give an award and they're not loud, they're not obnoxious, they're not, you know, I'm, I'm going to stand here and give a speech to Stefan Glaub or I would. <laughs> but they, they've got, sat down and done the research and they will tell you eight things about the person they're giving the award to that is so personal and so meaningful. And that sort of court is so lovely to watch. Uh, you know, our, our last Several crowns have been great. I was I was so grateful it was Theodoric and England during the long crown because they were perfect. They're so calm, but but they're so warm, and 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 that was a really nice tone to have during that really difficult time. Absolutely, it was awesome too. By the way, great people. <laughs> they did a wonderful job then in such a difficult time. Amazing. Yeah. yeah thanks, your graces. Well, thank you, your graces. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> um, so I think that about wraps us up thank you again so much for joining us and do say hello to Edward and the cats for us we will do <laughs> he's off hanging out with the cats if you think I'm lazy wait till you meet Edward <laughs> <laughs> um, I think um, I believe... sorry go on no no I think tomorrow Alpha Ooh. is being interviewed I'm going to tune in for that yeah so. absolutely Yes, that will be an interesting one. Do uh, like and subscribe to our page to see all of the upcoming interviews. And thank you again, Your Graces, for joining us. And we'll see everyone in the future. Thank you, Eva. Thank you, Land. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Altani. Thanks, Eva. Bye.